G'day Cobbers, <laughs> welcome back to the bush. In this episode of Lock Arms Full Driving, we're going to show you how to use a can of simple air duster so you can get your bearing races down to about negative 40 degrees Celsius in order to shrink them and aid installation. But as you know, if you've watched a video two of mine before, I'm not all about the how, I'm all about the why. So let's start having a look at that. Now the first thing you want to understand about these disposable cans of air duster is they don't actually contain air either compressed or in liquid form. It's good reason for that, and I'll get to that in a second. What they do contain, however, are a couple of different versions, usually, of environmentally friendly, in inverted commas, refrigerants. Now, the reason they don't contain air is there is actually a process for liquefaction for air. It requires a lot of temperature control and a lot of pressure. Now, the resultant product wouldn't be able to be held in a disposable can, your standard disposable can. So... Basically, it's a matter of economics, that's right. It comes down to dollars and cents. Now, the behaviour of the particles of the refrigerant in liquid state is governed by the intermolecular forces, such as van der Waals forces or hydrogen bonding. But we don't have to worry too much about that. All you need to know is they're weaker in comparison with the stronger covalent or metallic bonds found in a crystalline structure, the likes of which you'd find in, say, a metal. These intermolecular forces enable the particles to remain close to one another, but still have enough mobility, they're able to slide past one another and it's able to remain in a liquid state. So what happens when you press that button? Well, usually the nozzle's up the top here, so we're drawing from that gaseous layer, but this time we've inverted the can with the nozzle at the bottom and we're drawing from this liquid layer. Now for the same size orifice in that nozzle, we're gonna get a lot more product out because liquid takes up a lot less space than gas. So we're really pushing that product out of that nozzle. Okay, so we press the button, and what happens? Well, it's a phase change. It's a phase change from liquid to gas. Usually things go from a solid to a liquid to gas. Not always, but usually. It draws the heat from the surrounding, and that requires a lot of energy. And the only energy it's got around it is the heat from the atmosphere. And that's called an endothermic reaction. So an endothermic reaction creates a lot of cool because it's sucking in that heat to vaporize into a gas and when it does it draws in as much heat from anything around it in order to process that reaction now as to the refrigerants are used here's a couple of examples the first one difluoroethane now that's got a boiling point of negative 25.6 in standard atmospheric conditions so what that means is as soon as it gets pushed out that nozzle and hits the atmosphere, it boils instantaneously and turns into a gas. The same with the tetrafluoroethane. Again, around the same boiling point of negative 26.3. So again, just like the difluoroethane refrigerant, when it pops out that nozzle there, it hits atmospheric conditions, boils instantaneously, and then we have the phase change from liquid to gas. That's how it works. So why would the diameter of your bearing race get smaller when you cool it down? So metals have a defined crystalline structure. Now this one for steel is called the face-centered cubic crystalline structure. But the main thing you need to understand at 20 degrees, it'll be a certain distance between those molecules. When you cool it down to say negative 40, and this is an exaggerated example of course, they get a lot smaller. So it actually shrinks when you cool it down or inversely expands when you heat it up from the current temperature we're at. This is called the coefficient of thermal expansion. Let's have a little further look at that. Now let's have a look at the coefficient of thermal expansion for a couple of various common metals. So firstly, aluminium, 23.6, but you'll notice that's 10 to the negative six. So it's a very, very small amount. Copper is a lot less, 16.5. Stainless steel, 17.3. This is our common bearing ray steel. So we got 12.1 there. Titanium is even less at 8.6. And finally, brass, 19. So the thing to take into consideration is your coefficient of thermal expansion or contraction depends on what it's made out of. Aluminium, for instance, is going to expand or contract a lot more than the likes of steel. So how would the coefficient of thermal expansion relate to the change in diameter of that bearing race? This is how you work it out. So firstly, it's the coefficient of thermal expansion for steel times by the diameter of the original bearing race at 20 degrees Celsius times by the change in temperature in degrees Celsius. And remember, we're going from 20 to negative 40. So that's a 60 degree 
change. Righto, so for a 100mm diameter bearing race, it should go down to 99.9274 millimetres. <laughs> and that's a change of 0 0.07. And as we get smaller, the change gets less. So 75 goes down 0 0.05. 50 mil goes down 0 0.03 or 0 0.04 roughly. And finally, 25 mil goes down 0 0.018. And that's how the coefficient of thermal expansion works to change the diameter so we can push in that bearing race a little bit easier. And while the theory is fantastic, let's check it out from a practical standpoint. Let's cool down some bearing races and see what diameter they take on. Now, for those who aren't familiar with how a bearing race like this stays put and doesn't move around, it's what's called an interference fit. So the diameter, the outside diameter of the bearing race will be very slightly larger than the inside diameter of where it fits into. So you have to press it in with a fair bit of force. And the higher the interference between the two, the harder you have to push. <laughs> so by reducing the diameter of the bearing race, we can actually make it go in easier. So I've got a micrometer here. And let's check out the outside diameter of this bearing race. Okay, and as you can see here, it's 82, just under 82 millimeters. So it's 81.99 millimeters. Okay, so we'll cool it down now and we'll check out what temperature it comes to. And as you can see, if I put the thermocouple probe under there, it's sitting at roughly room temperature i've been handling a bit so temperature is up a bit sitting at about 22 degrees celsius okay let's cool it down Well, we're not going to get too much more cold than that. <laughs> the can's expended. Okay, so let's take it off of our plate here and measure it up again. And there we go. We're down to 81.94. So we've dropped 0 0.5 millimetres in diameter. So it's actually shrunk. Now I assume there's going to be some concerns about the layer of frost on the bearing and how that might lead to rust. Well, been doing it for a while and if you cover them with grease first, it's never really seemed to be an issue to me. I just wipe them off before I throw them in and uh, Bob's your uncle. <laughs> now you can get dedicated free sprays, but they seem to run about 40 or 50, anywhere up to $80 for a can. This one <laughs> from my local computer shop was 450 a can so it's a bit of a no-brainer there buy the cheap stuff and turn it upside down if you need to do this this technique can also be great for getting rusty or stuck nuts off of bolts because you're causing a temperature difference between the bolt and the nut and therefore we'll shift it around a little bit and that might be enough to loosen the nut it's like the opposite of heating up the nut in order to get it off Anyway, guys, now, if you like this video, don't forget to give it the old thumbs up. And if you didn't, by all means, give it a thumbs down. Not once, not thrice, but twice. Thanks, guys. We'll see you in the next one. So if you've enjoyed this content, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and ring that bell icon. It's really important to us and you won't miss out on our future content. Now, if you want to support the channel, by all means, consider becoming a patron on Patreon and you get things like early access to our videos on YouTube. Either way, we hope to see you out on the tracks.